cracks of New York City. This is the VD Clinic, and I am Darren. <laughs> With me, I've got my co-host, Vanessa. Hello. And Bo. Special guest, Bo Ransdell. This is the VD Clinic. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I'm great. I, I love being sing into a, a show, uh, <laughs> especially when when it's you know lyrics from a uh, a Summer of Sam uh, punk band, <laughs> right? Term abortion. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, they're filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. Yes, which is also uh, my party punch mix. <laughs> you making some Something prison hurt. wine in your toilet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, that's what you call it, prison wine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's cool to talk about this movie. I, I honestly can't recall ever hearing someone discuss this film with any seriousness, you know? And, and I think it's, like, spoilers, I think Summer of Sam is real cool. It is wow. right up there. I I pro I think I had this on VHS and then DVD. Not on Blu-ray. I don't know. Is, is it available on Blu-ray? I bought it digitally for for the. Yeah, I did yeah. too. Um, well, this is our an, another year of March Madness. It's a mm. little belated. Be well, because so much has gotten thrown out of whack because of the COVID nineteen. But, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're having ours. The The official March Madness got canceled. So, Yeah, well, exactly. This is just, it's, it's extended cabin fever madness is really what this is. I mean, if you're staying home as much as we are these days, you know. <laughs> yeah, the corona crazies. Yeah. <laughs> so we're here for some uh, distance socializing and... Some Summer of Sam and our Mind book. Hunter. Yes. Mind Hunter. Mind Hunter. Yes. Uh, right. I... As is a, a, a kind of tradition here, you guys bring me back anytime you want to get weird about serial killers. Well, you enjoy it just as much, I feel like, as I do. Yes. Well, I, I mean, hopefully as much. Or you at oh. least from near as much oh you yeah may, you may not be as obsessed as i am I, mm -hmm. I, there was a while i needed an intervention because all i was listening to was true crime podcast it was like i went down a bad dark hole like rabbit hole like it was just i yeah. needed it was out of my norm i usually have something to break that you know but yeah i had a few months where i was like no i gotta i gotta read i gotta listen it was just crazy but yeah. I feel like you you get that. You get that. I yes, I, I feel like I do. Uh I think that like a a solid, I don't know, ten percent of my day is spent thinking about serial killers. Um why that is, I can't say. I it's just <laughs> one of those things that, you know, like not anything in particular. I'll like just hey. Here's 30 minutes where I just think about how cool Silence of the Lambs is, you know, um, it, it's that kind of thing. It, it, it's an obsession that, you know, as I've talked about before on this show, I've had since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated by how a, a human brain can break in a way that just makes m makes a person a monster, you know, like. That right. is the the real world extension of my love of horror films is I also love, uh, you know, movies and books and stuff like that about how just honest to goodness, real regular schmegular people can get like, you know, a coconut dropped on their head and molested as a kid. And that combination of things will just make them murder every sex worker in a tri-state area. And you know, it's it, all that stuff is horrible. Yes. But I, I find it infinitely fascinating too. And, and 
you know, and I think that what's interesting about the stuff we're talking about tonight, like one thing very much what the book plays so much into uh, the the real world stuff that I love about that. And right. the the movie, on the other hand, is much more of like an almost impressionistic take at times on here is the more societal impact of someone like this operating a community, you know, right. Summer of Sam is despite the title and the fact that, you know, David Berkowitz is a character spoilers. David Berkowitz is the son of Sam, you know, just in case, (laughs) you Um, didn't know that one already. (laughs) Right. If you're, if you're like, Oh, please don't give it away. Like I'm reading the book. Um, sorry, but David Berkowitz is a character in the book, in the, in the movie, but he's not the focus, you know, it, it's yeah. really, it really is like, as the title suggests, it's about just this period of time in New York when this was going on in the background. Well, and I mean, obviously we're jumping right into it, which, you know, it's fine with me, but you know, that this was directed by Spike Lee came out in 1999, but that was kind of what Spike Lee was going for because partly because the fam like the families of the victims didn't want it to come out at all. Like, Oh, you're, you know, you're glor, you know, you're glorifying Berkowitz. They w- they didn't want it to be like that. And I'm glad Spike Lee kind of, realized no it should be more the impact of what people like this have on society and this culture of fear that some of them create and and i think that was part of berkowitz's goal because he did reach out to the media you know the film opens with jimmy breslin and that was one of person like he had addressed his letters to yeah, like yeah, it, journalist Jimmy Breslin. So, I mean, that speaks volumes. Yeah, and you know, I mean, a, a slight teaser for the conversation about Mine Hunter, but that is something that is somewhat unique to certain serial killers. Like, not every killer right is, is going to want to have that relationship with the media, and but Berkowitz certainly did. Like, he wanted. Uh, you know, the world to know who he was, even though, you mm-hmm. know, and in, in, until he got caught, nobody knew his name. But, it, you know, paralyzing New York City with fear had to be this rush for somebody that was such a, you know, defeated, lonely man in his in his real life. And yeah, you know, I'm, but that's the psychological need that, you know, the, the letters to Breslin and the press seem to fulfill. And, you know, I think all the shit, the, this is my own pet theories, but all this stuff in there of like, you know, uh, you got to stop me shit like that. Um, I don't think that Berkowitz was ever interested really in being caught. Uh, I, I don't think, I, I think because of his psychology, I think it was inevitable. I don't think he was. Uh, the kind of killer that, you know, was going to keep it under wraps for long. It was just, it was too loud. It was too messy. Somebody was going to see something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, not for lack of trying, you know. Um, and and it's weird uh, watching the movie. And you probably have this reaction too, Vanessa, where they mention names of victims. And you're like, oh, right. I remember like, oh, that was you know, the fourth and fifth victims or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, and one thing that was kind of weird to see in the film, uh, was when he shoots people, it was like, Oh, he was never really that close. Right. Right. No. And I, I, I think that's something interesting about Berkowitz is that, I mean, let's call it what he is. He was a bit of a coward. He wasn't getting his hands dirty to the degree of like a Bundy or someone like that. You know, he shooting on someone you have it, you can have a distance, but he, I mean, yes, he still killed these people obviously, but he, it it gave him like a, you know, the distance because 
he wasn't going right up and, you know, point blank range and shooting them. He did have to have a certain distance because it was like he had a certain fear of these people to some extent, too. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think his the anger and rage, you know, as right. they point out in in I think they mentioned in the movie. I know it's certainly in in the book, but um, that there was this rage he had towards women. Right. And that the men in the car were incidental. Of course they were. They were very much so. And the first two victims in the movie were two women in a car together, right? Yes. Yeah. And I. Yeah. Okay. Were the food? <clears throat> sorry. Were the first two real victims two women? Um. There, the first victim was actually a stabbing. Interestingly enough, of one woman. But then the next shooting that took place was two women. Yeah. Like the the next killing was two women. Yeah, his his first three victims were all women, and then and yeah, right, and then that then he gets into the well. There there's the the two on the date, then there's two other women, and then there's another date scenario. And at any rate, yeah, he. Yeah, what, you're right. There were there was another instance where it was just two females sitting there. And, um. And then a solo woman who was shot. Yeah. And that and that's the one that got him caught. That was the one where right. uh, he had he got the parking ticket. And and the movie opens. The movie kind of gives you a little bit of a head fake because it opens with that initial killing or the, or the not the first murder, but the first shooting murder right. of, of the two women. And it's and it's pretty graphic and so forth. Not horrifying or anything but rough and then the movie is just like yeah 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 but that that's just the backdrop that's <laughs> that is the setting for this yeah because this movie really does focus on well i mean it was originally supposed to just focus on richie but then spike lee realized well, I mean, he had John Leguizamo playing Vinny, and he let him improvise a lot and realized he really, I mean, he really liked what he was doing and then kind of just created more of the Vinny character. So it turns out to be more of a story about Vinny and Richie and then this other group of people behind them and then the community and their reaction to uh, Berkowitz and Son of Sam. Yeah. It, yes, it becomes very much a story of the neighborhood and the people in it. Right. Um, and Joey I, T. Woodstock. <laughs> I know. Richie and, the Freak. Bobby the Fury. <laughs> what? Well, yeah, is that Bobby the Fairy? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, whatever. The, uh, Michael Imperioli was what, like Captain Midnight or some weird? Yeah. Name. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which actually, actually, it should be noted that. He helped write the screenplay for this as well with Spike Lee. I saw that he was an executive producer. Yeah, yeah, which I didn't realize until I watched it this time that he had worked on the screenplay. Yeah. And he was supposed to play Richie, right? Yeah. But he was busy with Sopranos or something? Yeah, but honestly, I do think that Brody was a better fit for yeah. it. Oh, I, I think he's fucking great in Summer of Sam. I think Adrian yeah. Brody is like... From the time he enters the film, you forget how good an actor he is until you see something mm -hmm. like this or the the pianist or something. Yeah, well, and I like, have to, and I have to say, well, go ahead. Right, like even in in uh like bit roles, and I don't know why he has faded into a kind of obscurity because the guy is legit great. Oh, I know, I know. Well, and and I, you know, the one thing like one thing I love about this movie is that. It just captures New York and that time period, particularly of New York, where it was so grimy. The blackout happened. You know, Son of Sam was going on. You know, there was punk like versus unemployment. Disco. <laughs> right. Punk versus disco, which the oh God, the soundtrack in this is fantastic. Uh, I do have a soft spot for some disco. Don't get me wrong as much of a punk as i am <laughs> i still it's have catchy. a soft spot it's catchy. I have, 
<laughs> Wait, it, it goes it goes back to many of my uh, clubbing days. Um, but no, I just there are just certain things in here that I'm like it captures just such the spirit of that time period and of this community. And that first shot we see of Richie getting out of bed, you know, they have on the radio, the local radio, 1010 wins. And their tagline is still the same. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was literally, legitimately, they still play it the exact same way. <laughs> you know, here it is 40, you know, whatever years later. <laughs> it's, it's hysterical. Well, yeah, I'd like to see some things never change. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Oh, I love it though. And I, the I mean, they, they use local newscasters like Ernie Anastos, and they just threw '70s wigs on them. <laughs> like, <laughs> I kind of love that too. Like, that was just a little thing that made me smile. <laughs> just from I, the, New, the New York point of view. <laughs> I just think that, like the the movie does such a great job of capturing both the era um, and, and just uh, sort of the vibe of the neighborhood. Like it feels right. like uh, particularly those scenes uh, that, that you see, you know, starting early on with uh Leguizamo as Vinny, like, come on, come on. Like I know. if there is a misstep in this movie, it's having a Latino play in Italian, Hispanic ass, John Leguizamo uh, being fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I love him. So oh, much, he, yes, but he's he, not Italian. He's supposed to be Italian in this movie. Yes, yes, he's named oh, Vinny. Well, okay, I I didn't even let that pull me towards it to ever thinking that he was supposed to be Italian in this movie. But oh no, I know he's supposed to be Italian, but I I just kind of block it out of my mind. I let it slide. I I believe you yeah. both. I just play him as. A, a non-Italian guy that the Italians aren't total assholes to. That he just grew up in the neighborhood? Yeah, you know, I thought yeah. he was maybe a Puerto Rican guy or, yeah. Well, uh, my assumption is he's supposed to, like, if you don't look at the name Vinny, I'm thinking, although they could call Vincenzo Vinny, like, or this Vincente, which yeah. is a more Latino version of Vincent, but... You know, he could be a Puerto Rican living up in the Bronx with the Italians, but yeah. you're married you know, a at nice that time, Italian girl. He's Catholic too. Of course he is. You know, <laughs> it's, he's got that weird fucking Catholic sex, sex logic. I don't but, get oh. that. Oh my god. Oh, I, I don't know that I can explain it, but I understand it. I do too. Uh, <laughs> sadly, sadly enough. Yeah. <laughs> and thankfully, I broke out of that. So, <laughs> well, yeah. So, I mean, for listeners, the whole deal uh, with with his character is that he is just a serial uh, polygamist, um, where he is he is cheating no, he's on. Just, he's just a cheater. Yeah, he's cheating on Mira Sorvino, and what in the fuck are you thinking? Right. But right? Mira Sorvino is just cute as a button in everything she's ever been in. And she's and she's she's still she's sexy in this, and she's even willing to play like sexually with him, but he won't do it because she's his wife. It's a right. sin. What <laughs> the fuck? You've got it made. It, it's immaturity. I mean, when you get right down to it, it's this notion that you want you want your wife, the mother of your children, to be this Madonna esque. You know, not pop singer, but even, you know, they don't even have kids. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but it's it, just it. <laughs> right. But it, it's like I, there are things that you 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 want to preserve the innocence of of this woman, but you're also in in doing that you are denying the essential humanity of your partner, and right. you know that she needs to be this this object that you can adore and worship. But she's not a real person and she doesn't really like, you know, she's going to work and she's going to come home and she's going to clean. And, you know, when when it's time for sex, it's socks on, lights off, missionary, missionary style. position. Yeah. And then when you want to get like when you want to fuck, when you want to get dirty, you, you you fuck her cousin as he as he does in this movie in the ass. Yes. Let's point that out. Like. He won't he won't even request that okay maybe I want to have anal sex with my wife or just even role play where she's like you know putting on the wig and 
putting on some different lingerie and or she even wants to just keep the fucking lights on god damn it is that too much to ask and right. that is for him that is he's like you know you just don't do things certain things like that you don't do that with your wife right he gets and, almost upset when she's trying to give him a blow job well but there's that push pull too where there it clearly he's enjoying it yes and, and then that Catholic guilt part of him takes over mm-hmm. where it's like, oh no, I can't, I can't let my wife blow me and enjoy it. Like that's what whores do. That's not my wife. My wife's not a whore. Well, and his ultimate freak out is after they go to Plato's retreat. Yeah, you Better forget. <laughs> you will forget that Summer of Sam has a straight up eyes wide shut orgy scene in it. Um, Which I mean, they did cut line. Yeah, which and they did cut out some of that so it would avoid an NC seventeen rating. But yeah, right, and like Lug was not only is he uh, serially cheating on his his wife, but he is also doing a, a shit ton of drugs. Yes, and then when he they end up going to like this midtown party, well, they're originally going to go see Richie and his band. And they, they go to CBGB's where he's playing and all the people outside CBGB's look like Darren and, <laughs> and Vanessa <laughs> and Vanessa. And they're like, fuck this. This ain't our scene where we need to go some, uh, where, where people have really big lapels. Well, and they were all dressed for like <laughs> disco dancing anyway. And they go to a punk club. It's like, uh, uh-uh. right. On the lower East side. You don't do that. Well, but they also do it's just not their world. There's no, no. sense that like, don't Oh, understand. Right. And, and that's one of the big things too, is that, well, we'll get to that in a second, but so they, they go to the CBGBs and Mira Sorvino is like, yeah, I don't know, Vinny, we better take off. I don't like any of this. Gonna steal a car. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the way that girl's looking at me. And to, hilariously, all, some of the women in line are just like, come on, baby. Like, fucking with them because they do look like they're uh, ready to disco well and it you know and the situation is early in the film you had like you have well throughout the film you have all these people giving richie a hard time because he's dressed because he's a punk and he's dressed like that and they think he's a freak they they think he looks like a freak well here you have one when, when um when Vinny. And Donna go to CBGB's. They're all dressed for disco and everything. They look like the freaks because they're totally out of their element with all the punks. It's like it's just flipped on its ear. Right. It, it, like, yes, step outside the neighborhood that they're in and and they encounter this other part of New York that they just they couldn't understand less. Um, and so they take off and go to uh studio 54 because that's much more the you know disco inferno kind of club but they what they can't get in but it's john heard or john savage rather who is like hey you guys want to go to a party and they're like (laughs) yeah sure and it turns out it's nothing but like booze and coke and quaaludes and everybody's fucking everybody at Plato's retreat, the. I want to leave. I don't want to leave. You want to leave? I don't. You know, if we want to stay, I think we could, we should we should stay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the way I have to say, I've always loved Leguizamo, and he perfectly captures a guy who is so like way high on coke and pills <laughs> right. throughout this movie. Like as the scene as the movie gets, you know, later. It's just, and he gets worse with the drugs. Oh my God. You're just like, Jesus Christ. Like, I don't know what, are you doing method acting or something? Because you're doing a great job of convincing me. You're fucking hopped up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. it. There is that almost Ray Liotta-esque Goodfellas thing happening by the end of the movie where he is just out of his fucking gorge, just coke to the gills. Oh yeah. Yeah. Eyes red. Yeah, it, it's great. But yeah, so but to your point uh, about them going to uh, Plato's retreat and they do a bunch of fucking and like he's fucking somebody he's looking over and she's getting fucked. And 
they're fucking each other fucking separately. And it's everything. Like (laughs) if he were a mature dude, right. He would recognize like all of the shit that I like, all the stuff I'm fantasizing about she's up for. And all he would have to do is just embrace it. And they would have a crazy weird marriage, but it would be awesome. Right. Um, right. Cause, cause she all along, she's like, what do you need me to do to satisfy you? Well, and she, the fact that she even reaches out to Ruby played by Jennifer Esposito at one point who had been with Vinny in the past and who is now with Richie. She's like, what is it? Basically, what does it take? What does Vinny like in bed? She's asking Ruby this and Ruby's like who everybody considers, you know, the neighborhood whore. Um, she's just like, you're asking me how to please your husband. Like, I mean, like really like that shouldn't be asking. That's not a question you should be asking me. You know, but she does point out first thing you can't be his wife. Yeah, because he's got that fucking block in his head of a woman has to be Madonna or a whore. Those are the only roles she can fit into. She can't be, you know, a wife and potential mother and still want to fuck like crazy. Yeah. And do and do whatever like sexually. She can't be that person. They can't coexist. Which is completely ridiculous, but yeah, Catholic, I, Catholic guilt. You right, know. It, like he is a, a handful of therapy sessions away from having a great marriage. Um <laughs> Oh, he's more than a handful away from it. You're you're probably right. But like he's Mira got Sorvino, that deep, he's got that deep seated religious shit going on. That takes a little bit more than a couple of sessions sure. or a handful of sessions. <laughs> but like Mira Sorvino is totally down. She is like, what yeah, like what do you what do you want? What do you need me to do? You wanna like you want me to blow you, you wanna fuck me in the ass, whatever you want to do. She's like I'll do to save it. her marriage. Yes. It, she and, and she realizes that it's something sexual, it's not otherwise. She knows that he loves her in a way, but it's just the translation sexually, but that isn't a component of marriage. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's it, what she's just like, what does he not get? Like, yeah. And she doesn't know how to just come right out and ask him where he can. And he's not, you're right. He's not mature enough to accept the question or actually think of an answer for it. At this point. Right. I mean, I mean, every time he gets a little bit close to being able to, you know, marry the Madonna and the whore with his wife, it, it he freaks out. Like, it just, it blows a circuit in his head. Um, well, and, and all the drugs make it even more paranoid and worse. Sure. Uh, although. I mean, truthfully. It is. One of my favorite scenes of the movie, though, is the, the aftermath of the Plato's retreat when they're driving home kind of in silence for a while. And when Mira Sorvino finally gets him to talk and he, and he asks her about, you know, did you like more than me? Did you have, did you, was it, was it better than me? When she gets out of the car and it's just like, I hope a big black guy comes (laughs) along. Who's got a big bad black cock for me. (laughs) Well, you you know, that entire scene was, you know, that entire scene was improv. I, it, had to be the I only mean, the only thing is like spike spike lee gave them the basic premise and then told john leguizamo but did not tell mira sorvino spit in her face at one point so that she slaps or something does something back to you that was the only direction given they were just told to go with it that's great and, and you know what it, it, it's such an effective scene yeah it, it's very good because it's really the last point where Mira Sorvino is just like, I'm done with you. Yeah. Like I, I, I did. She's tried. Right, She's I, tried. I did shit tonight. I never would have done in a million years just to try to make you happy. And if this won't do it, mm-hmm. there, what will? It'll kill me, whatever it is. <laughs> right. 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 Like, do I just have to do the Requiem from a, a dream? 
at the, you know, the Jennifer Connelly bit at the end of that, is that where he's okay with things? And I mean, clearly not. He's a, 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 again, he wants to preserve her as some, you know, put her on a pedestal and she's this perfect, whatever. No. Yeah. You know, but but, all right. So let, we should probably shift over to Richie a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But Richie is, uh, you know, Adrian Brody, who has left the neighborhood for a while, has come back and he's deep into the punk scene. And um, he, he's even talking with a British accent when he first I, shows I know, up. I know. It's oh, all about the attitude. <laughs> it's so it's all in the attitude. The attitude. <laughs> right. And Union so, Jacks. And yeah. And Jennifer Esposito was into it. Oh She's God! Like, oh, I, you're you're so exotic. I love her so much. She's just, really good in this. I know. Well, I've always liked her, and it just it makes me every time I see this, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I you know I don't know why I forget that she's in it because I'm like, God damn, she is good in it. She's really good in this. And and she's kind of the anti Mira Sorvino, Mira Sorvino character, who like you said is the considered the neighborhood whore. But when she and, and Richie hook up, it's like their relationship is completely honest. No, and he even like the first time they're like hanging out one on one where he, she's helped him like, you know, decorate the garage or whatever at the house for his new room. After, he you know, Eddie she's going to give him the blue balls. Right, I know. I love and Patty. I love that Patty Lapone is in this too. By the way, as you know, as his mom. Um, but you know, she's gonna give him a a blowjob, and he's like, no, 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 no. And she starts to go, and he's like, no, I don't want you to go. Like, and she's not used to a guy who is genuinely interested in her beyond something sexual. Yeah. And it's, yes. and so she's like, wait. I mean, she's already liked him clearly, but this just further cements it and it is much more honest. And as things go on and yes, they do things more sexually, there's still more honesty with the communication that they have. Right. Like the crazy shit that they do sexually with each other is cool unlike the Leguizamo relationship theirs is cool because they're both up front with like this is what I'm into this is you know yeah this is what my life is are you cool with it yes then great yes you know because (laughs) yeah it's right worth pointing out here Adrian Brody is supplementing his income by going and and dancing for basically you know gay men and uh, is, you know, moonlighting as a sort of midnight cowboy esque sex worker. Yeah. And, and but is also doing ends up doing movies with uh, Jennifer Esposito. Ruby. Ruby. Yeah. Yeah. And like they that's just kind of what they do to make some money while they're like she starts getting into the punk scene as well. And they're starting a band. And, you know, it's like this is the relationship that. And in, in left to their own devices, you know, maybe the band's successful, maybe it's not, but it seems like they're headed somewhere. Like you could see this couple settling down in a, another five, six years and getting a place out of the city and commuting into work and just being a couple, you right. know, but this is right. their crazy young years. Yeah, but you're right. They're honest with each other. And this is. You know, they also seem to have a much more um, even dynamic compared to Vinny and Donna, where Vinny seems much more controlling of, uh, sorry, Deanna is her name. I want to say, yeah, I want to call it her name or something else, but it's Deanna. You know, he just seems like he has much more of the upper hand in the relationship. It it doesn't, the power dynamic isn't even in that relationship. Yeah. Right. Well, until, right. It's, it's until much later when she's like, no, fuck you. I'm leaving you. Like, I mean, that's really the only time that's when it becomes even. Right. Well, he dictates 
all of the rules of the relationship until she just refuses to abide by those rules any longer and, and right. leaves the relationship. And with, again, with Richie and, and Jennifer Esposito, Ruby, um, they're just, you know, they're, like they're just hanging out. They're just doing their thing. Right. Which, which is sort of what makes the end of the movie all the more tragic is, right. you know, um, but so th- those are your your central characters, and then you also have the the guys in the neighborhood. The guys who, in the neighborhood. Oh my god, the Guidos. Yeah, and they're sort of tied to the local mafia, and the you know loosely they're they, it's sort of like Ben Gazaria and his bunch. Yeah, they right. work for Luigi. I, I think Joey T works for Luigi. The rest of the guys are with Joey T, right? Yeah, I think that's more. I think that's a fair assessment. Because because when Luigi's setting up the block party and he's getting all the unused baseball bats and doing mm-hmm. the you know the mob forms a mob. Well, and he's the you know, and he's the one who's dealing the drugs. Mm-hmm. So is that done in conjunction with the mob? Maybe, maybe not. It's not explicitly said, but he's the one who has the connections. Yeah. So probably he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I know you can hear rustling of papers. That's because the cat has decided to move back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> off my lap, onto the couch, on my lap, off, you know, on the couch. Can't well, decide where to sit. <laughs> this has been my week. <laughs> well, and and so as Berkowitz, the the son of Sam, and and we see him just peppered throughout the movie. Yes, you know, like he is not the main story, but every now and again, a scene will pop up where he is killing again. And with every murder, you see the impact of that on the neighborhood. From everybody is starting to like draw up lists of who they think it could be, to uh, like Mira Sorvino's father getting her a blonde wig because all of his vi- uh, well, Berkowitz's victims had been brunette. Like, yeah, and you know, and that was a real thing that happened. Is that so many women got their hair dyed? blonde or they got blonde wigs because he was striking so many brunettes um you know so that that was something that did actually happen um real quick thing something about uh Berkowitz one of his shootings took place out in um like Forest Hills Queens not far away from where I used to live and interestingly enough also not it's near where that Kenna, uh, Kitty Genovese murder occurred. You know, mm-hmm. the one where they said there were like 44 witnesses or whatever and nobody called the cops, which is actually not true. But that's how the story ended up being falsely reported in the press and has kind of perpetrated for years. But anyway, yeah, I think that was I in the that beginning w- of Boondock Saints. Yeah, but I thought that was interesting that Berkowitz did that like did that shooting so close to where that crime had occurred in the sixties. So it was like basically 15 years later, he does it pretty much in the same location. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I well, think he had planned that out, but that's just where it occurred. But in Queens. Well, and you know, at the time, the seventies in the United States, it was just like everybody decided that they were just going to give in to their most sadistic fantasies. Oh yeah. I mean, the, the, like how we all of a sudden saw this, like it was like the golden age of serial killers in the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. I mean, it's it, genuinely, but particularly, crazy. I mean like the seventies, like, Oh my God, like all of a sudden it just like, you saw so many overnight. It seemed like, I mean, not that they hadn't been there before, but it's just, um, there were more opportunities, I feel. And and also, you know, to, to sneak preview the next conversation we're going to have. But it, it was also the point where more and more attention was being paid to those crimes because they were starting to be handled differently than just, oh, this is just a, a random murder. Well, and, and, you know, and that was the thing with the Kenny Gen- uh, Kitty Genovese murder, uh, Genovese murder, is that when it happened 911 as we know it didn't exist that was one of the reasons why 911 
I mean, came into being, you would, for something like that, you just call your local precinct. And they only, they had limited resources. So, you know, for something like that, that's a high priority crime that's in progress and, or someone who needs that kind of emergency health care, um, you needed a different procedure. And that was in the early to mid 60s that happened. I mean, like, that's kind of scary when you start to think 911 didn't occur, to be, you know, didn't happen before that. Like, that number wasn't there. Oh, so, sorry. yeah, it, 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 right. So, so you know, in, you know in when, terms when we, of. By the time we had this come around, you know, there were things in law enforcement that it's like, like I said, it's not like they didn't happen beforehand. It's just we all of a sudden kind of knew how to start dealing with them and start acknowledging them. Yes. And I think there was all uh, accompanied with that. As you see in the movie, there was this sense of not just public awareness, but public fascination. And, where, right. you know, like in the grand scheme of things, Berkowitz was not certainly the most prolific of serial killers. But the reason no. that it was so dramatic in these neighborhoods, I think, is that, um, you know, it. It, they were fairly close knit communities where all of a sudden just somebody within the neighborhood would be shot up in their car and, or the one stat and the wooden stabbing, right? The stabbing I think is weird that that's what he started with. And then he just went to a gun for the I, rest. I think it's because he got close and personal and realized that he didn't have the stomach for it. And that's, yeah. And, and that's why I think when I was saying it earlier on that he was kind of a coward, where the gun could give him a, a distance. I, I think maybe that's what it was, is that first one he tried to do up close and personal and realized he couldn't do it. He wasn't a Bundy. Not to say he's not dangerous, you know, but he just, it, it's a different thing for him. Right. He had to distance himself somewhat. That was the only way he could mentally handle it. And... One thing I do find that's interesting about this movie and that I enjoy about this movie, um, and it's kind of a Spike Lee type thing, um, where your lighting and camera work changes to these for these scenes of Berkowitz at home where he's having his freak out moments and, you know, where he screaming at the neighbor's dog and shoots the dog and, I love when the dog talks back to him. It's John Turturro's voice. <laughs> Can we just say that? It's Harvey the dog um, giving him the evil commands. Um, but I just, I kind of love that the way it's shot, it looks and seems so otherworldly. And then when you have Berkowitz in these situations where he's going up to a car and shooting it, it that is filmed much more like is grounded in real life. Yeah. The only other scenes I think that are filmed in that way, like the otherworldliness, are this, some of the scenes at Plato's Retreat, which makes sense because you're dealing with a different side of the id um, that's just completely, you know, the sexuality isn't repressed in the same way it is in other scenes. Yeah, yeah, you know. I think that's right. Right, it's it, this heightened reality, whether that's drug induced or it's yeah, you know, Berkowitz's psychosis. Um, but yeah, you're you're no longer completely attached to terra firma in no. in those scenes, and you know, and it's interesting. Uh, and I think that uh, doesn't Breslin mention it at the end of the movie that like yeah, the the dog thing is probably bullshit. Um. That was his story. Well, but... that was part of his initial story. That and like the satanic cult, which right. later on, later years, he admitted. And and again, we this comes in to play when we're talking about the book later on, Mindhunter. The you know Berkowitz later admitted he was all bullshit. Yeah, that you know, it it was his his effort to essentially you know get away not get away with it but you know like hey what's better to be in a mental institution or or you know a penitentiary 
So, you know, I think that's part of it. And there's, you know, as, as you see a, a lot peppered throughout mine hunter, there are, uh, these killers like to manipulate the press and the people around them. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, with Berkowitz leaving the letters at the scenes and stuff like that of, you know, these very theatrical, uh, sorts of descriptions of, you know, being the son of Sam and the, you know, chubby devil or whatever he calls himself. And yeah, you know, behemoth. the chubby behemoth. Right. Um, and, you know, you wonder how much of that is a product of him being, you know, genuinely disturbed, as you would have to be to commit these crimes. Right. And how And how much of it is performance. Right. Because there's clearly some of that in there, too. Yeah. Um, you know, especially when he starts, you know, responding to, like, who is it? Craig Gillespie, the, the reporter who... Uh, he sends letters to telling, you know, die Gillespie, die and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. Like I, Berkowitz is, is interesting on a number of levels, uh, partly because of the way that his MO changed, you know, as he evolved I- into a killer, he didn't get m- more savage with his killings. He no. just got further away from them in, in a lot of ways. No. Uh, oh, he just want, yeah, he, he would, you know, I guess he would call it a product killer. He wants, uh, he wants the, the dead women. He, it doesn't, doesn't really matter how he's killing them. And the best way he can do that without bloodying his own hands is with a gun. Right. Or, right. you know, uh, again, I'm playing a little armchair, armchair psychologist with this, but you know, that seems to be the case. And he just wanted to have not only have those murders under his belt, but be able to live that fantasy of the, of the power that he possessed over these women. And, you know, as we know, he would return to the, the the scenes of where he shot them and stuff like that. And yeah, he's, you know, he's an interesting serial killer because he doesn't seem to really care for the killing part of it all that much. He just wants these women to be dead. Which is right. horrifying. No, it's like a product versus process killer. Right. Like, it is. He yes. just wants the end result. He doesn't want the process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he's, so he's not, he's, he's so not like Bundy in that way where Bundy relished the entire process. Sure. Or, or, you know, BTK is another great example of someone who was like, I'm like the torture and the binding is just as important as like the death is, is significant, but the death is only going to come after he's squeezed, Mm. you know, terror and, and tears out of his victims. Yeah. Um, which to me, like, that's the, that's the, the scarier version of of this uh this psychology to me is the one that's like you know hey nobody wants to be killed by a maniac but if you're gonna be i'd rather be shot up to death than being one of those people that's you know captured and tortured just for pleasure yeah just give give me something where like like a berkowitz or dc sniper where it's done you know what i mean don't do you know, yeah no slow drawn out torture and rape and all this stuff it, no right and then right. kill me slowly no god no yeah i don't think and, anyone wishes for that yeah i mean people like ramirez seem to really enjoy it um yeah, obviously like the, the toy box killers like those oh god those are maybe the Late- most terrifying Leonard Link and Charles Ng. Yeah. I mean, that, like, yeah. The, the audio, we may have even talked about this on this, sh- this show before, but the audio of what they would play for their victims once they were captured is oh, just the, the most, like, terrifying thing. I don't Jesus recommend it. Oh, God, no. The, the toy box killer? And no. Oh, God, no. Don't listen to that shit. The same with Charles Lake and in a uh whatever lake and ing it's oh my god those 
Miranda tapes. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen like partial, like, no, don't do that. Do not do that to yourself. Yeah. There's. And I can't imagine having to listen or watch that kind of shit while you're in that situation, you know, bound and you know that that's your fate. I mean, like, God, way to fuck with your head. Like, that's that kind of psychological torture in addition to the physical torture that's going to occur. Like, Jesus Christ. Right. But again, that's, that's the point. That's they're right. in it. They're in it for those moments where, where they have ultimate control over their victims. Right. Uh, and, but you know, back to Berkowitz and right. summer of Sam. No, we were getting <laughs> back there. <laughs> so, you know, as the neighborhood is getting more and more tense and people are starting to hunt for whoever they suspect might be the son of Sam. I mean, they even beat up a priest. You know? <laughs> sure. They'll, like go through his car. Like, hey, hey, don't make this a thing, father. Let, let me let me go through your car. I know. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> bless them, Lord. They know not what they do. Was that in this movie? Yes. Yes, yeah, that it went, is. Yeah. Went, yeah. Cause they're like, Hey, how about a blessing? And he, that's what the, the priest responds with. And the guy's like, he's hey, like, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this boys. <laughs> yeah. Like there's still altar boys, you know? <laughs> right. And they kind of give him shit about like, no, 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 do it for real. Like give us a real blessing while we're going through all your shit. Um, I mean, look, I'm no fan of priests or nothing, but right, that, that right. is still pretty jacked up. Um, yeah, right. And they, you know, it's just a bunch of vigilantes. And of course, eventually their attention turns to Richie, who is talking with a fake British accent and has a Mohawk now and is dressing weird. And, you know, is it, is it Bobby the fairy who first kind of suggests that maybe it's Richie? Yes. Yes, because when he confronts him at Mail World. Yeah, right. and Richie's like, "Shut up, you know, you breathe a word of this, I'll kill you." Well, that's an idle threat a lot of people might make when they you are found in a compromising place and you don't want your secret life to become exposed to the general public. Doesn't mean you actually want to kill someone, but that's you know. He, Bobby the fairy, he brings it up to the to the group of vigilantes, and they're like, "Hey, now wait a minute, what about Richie?" Yeah, you yeah, know, our selective homophobia because, you know, we'll fuck with you, but nobody else can fuck with you. Right, and also they're like, "Okay, Bobby, you're fine. You just buy drugs off of us and act like a very stereotypical effeminate gay man of the that time period." You know, we'll just give you shit about that. But again, no one else can give you shit about it. Yeah. Right. Disco versus punk wars. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And OK, I got to I got to mention this. This is just my own personal tirade, partly as a costumer, but partly as a punk. The punks in here were very anachronistic. Most of them, like when they go to CBGBs, they look like 90s punks. They do not look like 70s punks. Because the facial piercings and stuff in the 70s, that was much more like a gay and like leather scene type thing, not a punk thing. Yeah, I didn't think they said something about tongue piercings, too, which I feel like came along yeah. later. The yeah, outside no, the only, definitely. Go ahead. Yeah, the only ones who were doing that kind of stuff at that point were gay or if you were in the gay or leather scenes, like that kind of piercing so, you know, maybe, sure, there might be one or two that overlap with the punk community, but not as many as they had there. So what, that, I, I, that's just a small thing <laughs> I had to mention. It was harder to tell with the interior shots, but the exterior definitely looked like it was shot there. Uh, yeah. Last night, I found myself recognizing the door with the... Mm -hmm the little glass panels and stuff. And I, right. I, remember, I remember that pretty clearly from when I was there. Uh, no, the last, the last time I was at CBGB's, I think they had the stage set up that way. Okay. Yeah. This was, I mean, it is RIP CBGB's is no longer in business. It has sadly been replaced by a couture 
a high end clothing store, but <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. Yo, that is a huge bummer. Um, I've, I've but I'm so glad I got the floor from the okay. backstage band area from when we played there. The floor was all busted, so I like just picked up a couple pieces of the concrete and put it in my stick bag. I went there a couple times, once for the first Afropunk festival that they had. Oh, right. Yeah. But, um, and then like another time, but I'm glad I got to go there before it closed. It's when, that was one of those really sad moments where you're like, oh no, really? Seriously? <laughs> At least they name, named the street corner by there Joey Ramone uh, Way. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I always kind of wondered if the Holiday Cocktail Lounge a block or two away was the one the Bouncing Souls sang about. I don't know. Uh, but I... anyway, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Adrian Brody really <laughs> reminds me of when I mention. first really got into punk, you know, when yeah. I was a young teen. Yeah, you know, I cannot say that I definitely never tried to speak with a British accent, but I sure as fuck talked about the Who all the time. It was just like punk, 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 punk music. And I worked my way up to the Mohawk. And uh, I didn't run around in my tidy whities and uh, around Eddie Sabatini and bum money off people. But I was <laughs> I was more, uh, you know, I was like 13, 14. So I was supposed to be living at my parents' house. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I really dig about this movie as a whole you know obviously this thing culminates with them going after richie and beating the shit out of him and um and on the same night that berkowitz is captured so that as they're beating the shit out of him across town they have found the real guy and it, it but it just shows you like you know i think the point of of the film in a lot of ways is lee's thesis that all you have to do to make people turn on each other and, and really highlight the differences between them is to turn the temperature up just a little bit. Right. Cause it was also a really fucking hot summer and people do crazy ass shit during the hot, the heat of the summer crime rises. Like it is a known, st- a known fact. It just yeah. happens. Right. So this it's happens. both literally hot and then you have this, you know, serial killer on the loose mm-hmm. and Leguizamo getting like after Sorvino leaves him, he's just doing nothing but popping pills and doing coke. And right. And he's so out of fucking control. Right. And it's uh, again, one of the most heartbreaking things in this movie is when they get the, the neighborhood Guidos get John Leguizamo to essentially lure Richie out of his apartment so that they can get him. And as they're talking, you can see like Leguizamo has this change of heart where he realizes what he's doing. And he's like under his breath, run, 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 right. Run. Run. You got to get out of here right now. But he's also so fucked up. He can't even verbalize what he really needs to say, like in a more coherent manner to get Richie to understand. Yeah. He's not together enough to get it. Yeah. It's, it's right. And again, they just, they beat the ever living fuck out of Adrian Brody. And Uh, actually Adrian Brody really broke his nose during that scene. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And so, you know, uh, his, his stepfather, I guess, yeah. uh, Sabatini shows up with a, a Luger and chases everybody off. He was like, Hey, you assholes. Like they caught the son of Sam. Go turn on the fucking news. You dumbos. <laughs> like yeah. really? My like, Luger says they got him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, and- <laughs> but I, but I do love, I do love though, that still like Bobby runs inside to go call the cops while the mom and stepfather are out there and, you know, Ruby's out there too. And then the gang of the guys that beat him up are just standing there and they're like, Oh shit. Like they have a moment of what the fuck, what have we done? Yeah. And they're like, almost want to say, I'm sorry, but they're like scared off by the gun and by the stepfather 
and Leguizamo stays there even longer, like, oh, shit, like, oh, my, like, in a bigger shock. But he's also still so fucked up on drugs. He is, it just hasn't connected for him. And he's the, the one lingering. But I, I do at least appreciate the fact that Bobby, who's one of them, that, I mean, he holds Ruby back. While the others beat, you know, except for Vinny, while the others beat uh, on Richie, you know, he at least is like, oh, shit, I'm going to try to make this right. And I'm going to call 911. Because they realize, oh, we fucked up. Yeah, we really fucked up. Yeah, it it, right. And and once you look at the, the scene after Bobby comes out of the house there's the entire group of them and they're still standing there. Not that far away. They've just moved farther away than they initially were. They're just still, but they're still like looking at him, like almost checking on him. Like, is he going to be okay? So it's not like they're totally closed off and don't care to some extent, but it's like a huge dose of reality hit them and they don't know what to do with it either. But yeah. there were these other vigilante groups in the city at the same time. It wasn't just, you know, that that kind of thing was going on at that time at, because of the way, you know, Son of Sam, like, just made everybody so, this culture of fear and then just made everyone so paranoid. Yeah, it, it's, again, it's just terribly it's terribly tragic and it's something, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but you know, you don't have to look beyond what's going on now to see how, as soon as you start making things uh, like, as soon as there is an external threat, something that you can't control and something that you don't fully understand. As soon as that happens, it really reveals sort of the weakest parts of our society. And I mean, the, the interpersonal parts of our society that are broken and, you know, the tribalism that, that can break out and the, the, the fear of the other and that sort of thing, you know, whether it's, you know, the uh, heightened, uh, violence against Asian American people in this country right now due to, you know, this association with the coronavirus or, you know, or, or the the exact opposite of, of, of people who are, you know, kind of brazenly thumbing their nose at any sense of, of social responsibility to other people. Yeah. You just see people doing like really shitty things under pressure. You know, you see a lot of heroic and wonderful things, too. And, and you like that's the thing that the Lee movie doesn't doesn't give you is the, the other side of that story of. You know, well, there there were people trying to do good things at the same time. Right. But, you know, that's not the point of the movie. I'm not going to give Spike Lee a hard time for, you know, like he, he was making a movie about something. Um, but, you know, I think that the message of that film and, and sort of what Summer of Sam is about is still really relevant. You know, it, it, whether it's a serial killer or, or yeah. a serial killer of virus. Um you know, it makes people do crazy shit. Well, I feel like it, it's certainly there is so much in this film that is about culture of fear and how the media plays into it, because it is always going back to these letters that Berkowitz wrote to the press, like to the papers. But then it's also, in a, you know, it has all these different moments of TV newscasts. Like I said, you've got Ernie Anastos. But I love when you have Spike Lee up there that's supposed to be a reporter. And I love his pausing that they have him, you know, yeah. that he, he does, where it's like, I'm here in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Like the pauses in there for a darker perspective. Like, <laughs> just fucking cracks me up and then sty yes at the time was i would say if not all but ex- almost predom- almost all you know african american at that time um it's still large populations african american there but uh 
But I just I, his his pausing and and phrasing in this it just it cracks me up because I'm like that is how they do they they did instruct certain news anchors I feel like of that day they they read in a smoother manner now than they used to but there were certain ones I feel from the 70s that they made <laughs> you know do that kind of phrasing. Um, yeah, I, that's one thing I did enjoy about the movie. But one thing, Bo, I have to point this out for you. Did you notice the Wilfred Brimley lookalike in the church scene? Oh, yeah, of course. Anytime oh, of course. I see somebody with a bushy mustache and okay. wire rim glasses, I'm immediately like, is that a Brimley? Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> Someone got to get out there and catch the son of Sam, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> It's <laughs> <laughs> a part of me is like, I would have loved if that were actually Brimley, but I know it's not <laughs> right. It, like if he had played the Ben Gazzara part, that's really where Brimley <laughs> would have shined in this movie. Uh, He's not Italian though. <laughs> right. I try some of the goddamn veal. Um, <laughs> the, there were only the thing, would have been six victims. <laughs> right. I'll tell you what, let me, I'll get out there with goddamn shotgun. We'll take care of business. Um, the thing that I ultimately, you know, where I come down on summer of Sam, I think, I think the movie is unfocused because of the way that it was made. And I think there are times where the movie can feel a little bit meandering, but, uh, the thing I kept thinking over and over when I was watching this movie was, man, I would rather watch a second tier Spike Lee movie because I I don't think Summer of Sam is as good as some of his masterpieces and I think he's got a handful. I but I think it's really good and and kind of you know ultimately the point I'm trying to make is like even if it's not the best Spike Lee it's still way better than about seventy five percent of directors work in a day. <laughs> And every now and again, I forget how good Spike Lee is. And then I watch one of his movies. I'm like, oh, right. He is a super talented director. Um, I, th I think at the end of the day, I am still of the mind that Malcolm X is the best movie he will ever do. Yes, I, I'm right there with you. I, I think that movie is just a work of art. And the last, yeah. oh, God, what, 20 minutes? The, the point where they, he does the the steady shot of Denzel Washington mm -hmm. walking down the street to his yeah. death. Yeah. Oh my God. That is so good. The, the whole movie is amazing, but that ending is just like a martyr going to slaughter is, is just one of those things that, you know, you can argue the historical accuracy of, of that, I suppose. Right. But my God, what a movie. Well, I will say for me, I, I really enjoy Spike Lee overall. And while I think, I think you might be right that this is not in his group of best movies. This is one of my favorite ones of his because I feel, as you said, it meanders here and there, but I feel that's almost necessary mm -hmm. to get the, to capture kind of these characters, that community and that time period and the, you know, and the tension of that these people are creating in that environment. And there are certainly some shortcomings in the technical sense, which doesn't make it, I feel like, one of his best movies. But I enjoy it more because of the way it, it meanders and does tie things together and does create this sense of just atmosphere. And because I, I feel that is ultimately what this story is trying to tell. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. I, I think it, for all its faults, like part in complaining about the meandering nature, you're right that you're also kind of complaining about, well, that's just sort of the tapestry of this movie. It's not it is not a clean, precise story. It is more like capturing this sort of slice of life at this time. And, but it, yeah, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a great movie. Yeah. Darren. Yeah. It, it's probably the Spike Lee movie I've seen the most. Uh, I only own this, uh, do the right thing. 
and uh, what what is his uh, association with that CSA mockumentary? I thought he was just like an EP on it or something. I was don't he, remember. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, I own that as well, but uh, I I have uh, Malcolm X. I, I love that movie. Uh, yeah. Thinking about that. Um, when you I, guys were talking about it. Go ahead. I know. I was just I, like, I kind of grew up with Spike Lee. Yeah, um, me too. Like, She's Gotta Have It came out when mm-hmm. I was really getting into, like, avant-garde cinema. and, and Baby, like, baby, please. Baby, please. Baby, oh, please. Baby, <laughs> baby, baby, baby. Um, <laughs> yeah, She's Gotta Have It is great. Then Do the Right Thing is a masterpiece. Yeah, um, obviously. That is a brilliant, brilliant movie. Uh, you know, I think Malcolm X is great. I, I Red Hook Summer, I was never able to really get into, but I think mm-hmm. uh, The Sweet Blood of Jesus is a really interesting movie, if I not a too. perfect one. I do too. Well, I like it a lot, but goddamn, I wish he would admit to it being just a goddamn vampire movie because it is a remake of Ganja and Hess. Come yes. on. Yeah. Get with the program, Spike. Like, but, come uh, on. Uh, she rock, uh, is, is great. Um, his, uh, what, it, what is the crap? I'm trying to think of the, what the play is that is based on, but oh, Chi- it, no, Chirac, Chirac. Yeah. No, it's Lissa Strada. That's right. Lissa no, Strada. no, no. Well, that would, that was a lot of people didn't see that. And I really liked that it's movie, but I also good. like Lissa Strada. So <laughs> it, no, it's a, it, you know. I thought it was a, a an interesting modern retake on it. Yes. I really thought that, and I feel like it was very underseen. Yes. Uh, like, again, I mean, Spike Lee's one of those, those and directors. And Black Klansmen, and Black Klansmen, of oh, course. Oh, sure. Which, Black which Klan- Darren and I have talked about on his show. Yes. That, that is a movie that felt like it was just Spike Lee reminding everyone that he's a genius. Right. It, and also it is very funny and, and, uh, w- what's his name? Adam driver. Is that yeah. it? Uh-huh. Um, he's, he's terrific in it. Um, so yeah, it, uh, like Spike Lee, again, one of those filmmakers that like, I remember being, being a kid and people criticizing Spike Lee for just being, you know, essentially a black filmmaker. That like his movies are geared towards a black audience. It is all about the black experience. Why isn't he making movies for the mainstream? And it was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, we've got enough Spielbergs. We need somebody. Like, he was one of the first truly, like, you know, impactful uh, black filmmakers of the the eighties and nineties. Of you know, aside from Mario Van Peebles, who seemed content right. to do more Hollywood stuff. Uh, unlike his father, Spike Lee felt oh, like. Oh yeah. Oh, thank <laughs> you for saying that too. I, I agree very. I I am very much on that page. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Spike Lee felt like the extension of Melvin Van Peebles mm-hmm. in a way that Mario Van Peebles never was. Yeah. And yeah, again, no. I mean, hey, make the movie Posse. I don't give a shit. I'll I'll see Posse too. But. <laughs> No, me too. I, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. <laughs> right. But, I, you know, but it ain't, she's got to have it. No. And, and it's not Sweetback. <laughs> right. Not the original. Like, no. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, well, those are the movies that seem to be capturing, you know, an, an experience and a perspective and an opinion. And that's one of the biggest complaints I think that people, when I was younger, people had about Spike Lee's movies was that they had an opinion. They had a, a perspective and a very, very distinct African-American point of view. And that bothered people a fucking lot. And, and I think to this day, I think he still pays the price for being so bold and so unapologetic about his subject matter as a filmmaker. And yeah, I mean, it would be like if, if, if somebody came out criticizing, you know, Spielberg for using nothing but white actors or something, you know, it's just like, what in the fuck are we even talking about? Right. Well, and and you, Spike Lee always has an opinion. It's a consistent thing. And and I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, come on. There are times where I feel like even uh, white directors need more of a goddamn opinion. They're just sometimes just too wishy-washy. Yeah. Like, and I'm not saying you have to make 
every film. It doesn't have to be, you know, have some sort of message behind it. And it doesn't have to have all these, you know, layer of principles. But as much as sometimes I like something stupid, like what we were talking about before, I think we start recording Fast and Furious or something like that, you know, or some stupid exploitation movie that I like. Um, I still want something more substantial every once in a while. And at least I feel like Spike Lee is a director I know I can count on for it. Right. Because also on top of that, he's got an interesting v- style visually. The soundtracks or movie scores are amazing. Mm-hmm. Always. From doing the Do the Right Thing where he worked with Public Enemy to this one where you've got the great you know, disco of the era, and then you've got the punk, you know, that perfectly contrasts these dynamics. And then, you know, the incidental instrumental music that you have that's sweeping in scenes. And I forget who did that, but I know it's the same composer that he's worked with on other films. Um, But, you know, it's... Oh, and don't go sleeping on... uh... He got game either. That's a great movie. Oh, he got game. Twenty fifth hour is actually pretty good. Twenty fifth hour is fucking great. Yeah, no, I mean it, that look, was Spike his post nine eleven movie, and I yeah, yeah, and and uh, that's another one where like Edward Norton is the oh, yeah it just delivers an amazing performance, but everything happening around him is what makes the movie interesting. And, right. Oh right. man. It like this whole conversation conversation just makes me want to watch every Spike Lee movie now. He is so good. It's yeah, like, I know. Well, no, I know exactly. What am I going to do for the rest of my day? Um. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like when I do that double feature later, it's uh, you know we're going to replace School of the Holy Beast with She's Got to Have It and He Got Game. <laughs> Damn it! I do have School of the Holy Beast on my wall over there. <laughs> it looked. Sometimes you just got to watch School of the Holy Beast. Yeah, well, I did make Darren watch uh, Sins of Sister Lucia. <laughs> you know, look, I, I enjoy non-exploitation non-splo- films as much as the next guy. Uh, but I School of the Holy Beast has a special place in my heart because it was the first of that stripe that I saw. And it's also, I, I think, one of the best in terms of just holy shit. Um. Uh, so yeah well, i know you do like your japanese films though too anyway but i i do and I, I so yeah i'm partial to that and i i just think you know the the, the first time is always the sweetest and <laughs> it was my my first introduction to non-exploitation it was just like oh wait they're all lesbians and have whips what the fuck is happening in my pants <laughs> um we, dig- of, we digressed. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of murder. Um, so as I was going to say, I, I think that we were all wrapping it up anyway. And I was going to say, so I think that sounds like, although Darren, I, Bo and I have been very, very vocal. Um, Darren has been a little bit more quiet, but I think it sounds like we would recommend this movie. Easily. Oh, God, yeah. Don't watch it with your parents, but yeah. <laughs> oh no, I agree with that. The word "fuck" is said like what two hundred, three hundred, yeah, two hundred, three hundred times, something like that. Yeah, I think they they calculated it's like every two and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. And it's not a first date movie either. Like okay. you don't maybe not depending on your date. Maybe yeah. I mean, it'll it'll tell you something. Um, like you can have, I suppose, uh, the conversation about like. So what did you think about the relationship between Vinny and Deanna? I mean, do you think maybe he should have just fucked her in the ass, right? (laughs) (laughs) What do you think about Ruby and Richie? (laughs) Right. They seem to have a really healthy relationship, right? What about doing the porn together, huh? (laughs) Yeah, let me me, get get set to upload to Spank Bang right now. (laughs) Where are we? (laughs) No, uh, I yeah, I think that as far as it doesn't sit there, I, I and I kind of as much as I'm interested in Berkowitz and Son of Sam, I feel that there are some of these movies that do 
maybe not glorify the killers, but they just dwell on them so, so much. And you do need at least the occasional, like, look at what they have produced. And in the case of Berkowitz, so much of what he was looking for was a reaction. And yes. and this is what I feel is so good about this movie, is that you get the reaction and how it affects a community and a community at that time period. That's what I enjoy so much about this. Yeah. It's, it's very cool. I mean, it, it, it's, it is a movie that you kind of ease into like a warm bath and just live in it for, you know, two and a half hours. And then when it's over with you, you just kind of, or at least for me, it was like, well, I now I just got to sit here and think about you know, what I've done with my life. And uh, and it, like in that scenario, am I going to be the Richie or am I going to be the Guido? You know, um, in in a, a situation where society is getting more and more tense, how do you respond to that in a way that's productive and healthy and not turning turning on the people uh, you know, on your neighbors, you know, perfect point. And I think that's a great, uh, place to wrap that, that, that portion up. I know we kind of started our serial killer analysis, but I think we've got a lot more coming on the other end of this break. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and on that note, we will be back in a moment. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. And we are back. We are covering Mind Hunter. Yes, it's the book, not the Netflix series, but it is the book written by Johnny Douglas and Mark Olshaker. Um, or Mark Olshaker. However, we are going to pronounce it today. I mean, <laughs> he's the assistant, is really, because it's really more Johnny Douglas doing the writing, in my opinion. It's his story. Um, the former uh, FBI criminal uh, profiler and one of the creators of that program. Um, yeah, there's so much that could be said, I know, about the book and about uh, everything in criminal profiling, but we are going to try to keep this to a minimum <laughs> and <laughs> rein it in a little bit. Um, I mean, he does talk about Berkowitz some in this book, but I thought that it's just we we keep bringing up the aspect about the psychology behind it. And so that's kind of why. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really find a good Berkowitz book that was not something outrageous. And I was like, oh, let's just do this. You know what I mean? So. Um, so, yeah. And I know, Bo, you had covered the series over um, at Duncan and Bo Come Correct. So. I I know you have maybe have an extra interest. Yeah, I have seen um, the first season of Mindhunter twice and the second season just the uh, the one time. But um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the series a lot. 
it was really interesting to me because I hadn't read this book before mm-hmm. to see how directly some of the stuff was lifted from the book. Uh-huh. Uh, I, that I was truly impressed that, you know, some of the stuff, uh, in, in the series, particularly the, um, I think the Richard Speck story with the bird. Yes. Uh, even though it happens in front of sort of the John Douglas surrogate in the series, but that was the thing that really happened. And, uh, it, 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 it genuinely surprised me. I was like, that sounds like this feels like it, you know, when you're watching the series that it's something meant to illustrate the character of spec and not really be a a real thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you find out that it was absolutely a real thing, (laughs) it's like, Oh yeah. Richard spec was a, uh, just a sadistic motherfucker as it happens. Right. Right. And incredibly selfish. Like I am, as I said in the upfront, like I am, crazy interested in uh, the psychology of, of serial killers. So the fact that I hadn't read the, this book yet is kind of crazy, but uh, it it really was, um, it's hard to say it's a pleasure, but it was such a, a, a compelling read because of how, you know, each chapter was sort of, Oh, here are killers that I have certainly uh, read about in the past and, you know, listen to podcasts about and that kind of shit. And here is John Douglas talking about, you know, Hey, as part of this case, here was my perspective on it. And, um, and I think maybe the most interesting part of it, uh, for me was the, the details of the at kid cases that to me, that is still one of the most fascinating, you know, periods in American, you know, murder history of like, Hey, we had a bunch of murders, probably not this guy, you know, or not all this guy, but we as a society just decided, you know what? It's a little bit easier if we just say it was him and all the Atlanta child murders. Yeah. Oh no. And I, I was going to say, I was going to bring that up. Actually. I, have a huge fascination with that because at that time that that was going on, I was about six years old and we were in the process of, we were going to move to Atlanta. And so we spent a lot of time there. My dad was there for work a lot uh, for extended periods of time, like um, off and on for a year. And so we went on a lot of trips up there and, you know, I'm white, but still you're on the news and you're like, oh, holy shit, there's a kid my age, you're not that much older than me, that's turning up, you know, they're missing or they're murdered. Because we would watch the nightly news every night when we had dinner. Yeah, that's the family I grew up in. Um, yeah, real healthy. But still, it was, you know, you're, that was just like, oh. And yeah, it was that kind of thing that also spawned this interest in trying, you know, true crime for me. But that Atlanta child murder case, I were real interest in. Be, yeah, it was, you know, that's one of the reasons. But I was going to mention, there's actually an HBO documentary series coming out um, in April th- this month. I think the first, it's premiering on April 5th, which is as of recording tomorrow night. So, just FYI. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, I know. And there had been that podcast, Atlanta Murder. Yeah. Or, yeah, Atlanta Monster, sorry. That's right, that's right. That was really good. Uh, yeah. And I'm so glad that that's finally getting more attention because it was – the I, I just remember at the time, like, I know I was young, but still, like, as it went on, it was like – Something, you know, and then as I got older, like, you know, like what I knew about it, it was like something didn't seem right. That it was just like, how is that all one person? And then you hear more of a breakdown. And it's like, wait a minute. He's just convenient to throw everything on. And, and it's like, yeah, you need to explore all these outlets. But yes, I mean, I think it is likely that Wayne Williams committed more than just the two he was convicted for, but not all of those kids. Yeah. Definitely not all those kids. Right. uh, To me, that is the, they didn't look into the child sexual abuse aspect. 
you well, know. And, right. And the different MOs and like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think Douglas in the book says he believes that there were at least two or three serial killers all working at the same time in that community. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's just, it's terrifying, you know? I mean, imagine not just, you know, uh, what it's like Florida in the, what late eighties, early nineties, where it was like, there are two or three serial killers all operating in the same general area at the same time. No, I think you had more than that actually. Right, it's just like but, I mean, Aileen Warnos was in there, but you had others in addition uh, to her. Because wasn't uh, like there was a, a God, I get, the Interstate Killer was yeah working yeah. at the same time, and, and yep. but I, I mean, it's just a, a lot of a lot of bad news, and uh, yeah, it it it's one of those things that the more you dig into the Atlanta murders, the more you. St- questions that you come up with that you just can't answer. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. a uniquely frustrating case because of that. And and also because Wayne Williams has never come clean. No, no. You know, and you, you can argue, well, that just means that maybe he, he's innocent. Although that seems highly, highly unlikely given all the evidence surrounding it. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because there there's a certain amount of forensics tying him to it. Yes, yes, there's it, a lot of not, fibers. It's and, not just you know circumstantial. There there are forensics connecting him. Yes, and uh, and also just you know the personality type and all that stuff. Like right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, plenty uh, to to tie him to the case, but uh, like you said, just not everything, and. Uh, because it's not everything, uh, you know, that all of the murders that happened at the time, um, you know, because we can't tie Williams to all of those. And also just the way he operated doesn't fit some of those murders. That means somebody either got away with it, um, or moved or whatever. Like I think Douglas mm-hmm. says, if, if a killer stops, it's generally because they died or they got picked up for something else and they're mm-hmm. in jail for a separate crime. Right. Uh, but man, yeah, that, that Atlanta stuff, not to, to take a total diversion on it, but man, that well, Atlanta I mean, murder stuff is so bizarre. That is one aspect of this. I mean, because there, this is something that covers like how the unit formed the profiling unit, you know, and program form within the FBI, but also it does go into certain cases, including that one. So, I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a diversion and I don't think there's really necessarily an order to go in because there, there is, he jumps around enough. I feel in this book <laughs> that that's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, ultimately the, the story of the book I think is, Hey, here is a guy who helped, you know, create the the behavioral investigative unit um but also the the theme seems to be this is all about broken people who usually had some horrifying childhood Mm -hmm. that contributed like uh, they might have been born with the capacity to to murder but it's really the the upbringing. It's the the nurture part of it that lit the fuse. Right. And 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 as a result, it left mostly men in a position where they felt this need to dominate and control. And most of the murders that Douglas talks about in the book kind of come back to that thing. It's it's almost always how do I control and dominate? not just my victims, but in the case of, uh, who was the, the, Oh geez, the kidnapper who, um, started corresponding with the family and ultimately kind of implied that he wanted, uh, to kidnap the sister as well. I can't think of the killer's name now. No, but, I don't remember, but you remember who I'm talking about, right? The, uh, but I, but I, it's yeah. some, even someone like an Albert fish who corresponded with the family of one of his victims after the death. Yeah. Like, I mean, something like that. It's the same kind of thing where it's this 
what? I mean, this weird like control and everything that is there. Right. Now, I have to not only control the people or control my victims themselves, but the victims' families, the press. Right. It's, you know, it, it, it's this uh, need to inflate the self using, you know, murder as a tool to, to be uh, better than, different than uh, other people. Um, you know, aside from the crimes of passion and stuff, there are some of those as well of just, you know, Hey, here was somebody that it was a serial rapist and, you know, not that that isn't about control as well, but that murder wouldn't have naturally happened it, it, except that things got out of hand in the situation, you know, um, you know, not that it excuses it or or anything, not at all. I, I just mean that there seems to be a difference between the people who just kind of g- go in for those rage killings as opposed to the ones who are like, I, I'm, I'm killing because I gotta, you know, that Ed Kemper type of like the rape is is maybe part of the equation, but it's really about like I, I completely control the mind and body of this individual um and that to me is is one of the most interesting things about the the book as a whole is this recurring theme of these are are men mostly young men mostly unsuccessful either socially or educationally or whatever trying to assert some kind of power And, and the way they do it is the most horrible way you could possibly assert power, which is to take power away from someone else. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and just take power away from people in the most severe manner. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it, it, it's one of those things and you may wrestle with this too, Vanessa, where it's like, on the one hand, I, I find all of this so fascinating. On the other hand, it is, it, it's the worst of human behavior. It is as oh, bad yeah. as a person can be. Oh yeah. And, and you don't want to celebrate that, but how, on, on the other hand, how do you look away from it? Mm-hmm. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> that, that's my problem. <laughs> is that it is absolutely my problem. Uh, are you like that there? I mean, like, uh, you know, Vanessa and I could go for hours on any serial killer probably, but are like, do you go down that rabbit hole of, of like, I want to know everything about what this person did. Sometimes uh, not, not as readily as you two or <laughs> seem to be, or as excitedly. Uh, I, I might've sort of, well, I, yeah, I used to do that a lot when I was younger. Uh, uh-huh. You know, I had all the books and I, you know, just hours on YouTube and just going into all of the stuff. But I found myself doing it a little bit less now, but I'm using more reputable sources. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's uh, it's work. I, I guess I'm I'm working a little smarter, not harder. But I, I've over the years that has been getting sort of outweighed by studying the uh, psychopathy of politicians. Well, you can look at, I mean, the chart of psychopathy. It really, you do have criminal profilers who were saying these same traits that we attribute to psychopathy in serial killers they also apply to world leaders and you know like politicians and ceos <laughs> like, yeah so totally so there, they... <laughs> there's this overlap it, a complete overlap in the psychology but where is that dividing line right you know that like, is what is so fa- that's fascinating to me <laughs> that's fascinating to me as well yeah yeah um, but yeah, I, I think there, there was that level of, you know, the jar of sand or whatever. I don't think it's really diminished, but my focus has gone lo- a lot of the way away from delving the way into politicians that I hate and fear 
that that's just been more focused on them a little bit the the more the older I got. Uh, the more focused on politics I guess I got. Yeah. Yeah. I I I right. I I think that yeah to Vanessa's point, you know, there there are a lot of studies that say that the the kind of psychopathy that um, serial killers display is evident in, in a lot of politicians. And, you know, uh, <laughs> was it the police who, uh, proposed that, you know, if, if the more people you kill, the less it becomes murder and just becomes, uh, yeah. a point of interest. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is that in the murder by numbers song or is that a different? Song? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't, yeah, I will. Thank you, Bo, for that reference. <laughs> sure. I, oh, I believe me. That song runs through my head on a near constant basis. Yeah. Um, first, you make a stone of your heart. That's how you start. Um, exactly. But yeah, and I th- there is something to that for sure because I think that also speaks to the idea of control. You know that it, it's instead of controlling an individual, it's controlling more of the world writ large. And, and that's terrifying. You know, I, I think when you, uh, not to turn this into a psychosemantic episode, but, um, <laughs> sure. Why not? It wouldn't be the first time, but you, you know, when you look at, at, at somebody like a Trump, um, it's hard to, mm, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to deny that he displays a high degree of, of sociopathy at the very least. Um, mm-hmm. you know, like recently when he, took an opportunity during a briefing about the coronavirus to talk about the ratings of his press briefings about a fucking pandemic. You know, that's one of those things where you're like that, that's not a normal person. That is not how normal people behave. No. Well, the amount of narcissism alone that someone like a Trump has to have that someone like a Bundy or Charles Manson or, you know, or whatever. Mitch McConnell is Albert ha- Fish. <laughs> really? Uh, well, you maybe, think? Somebody, maybe somebody else, <laughs> that's, but that that's who I Lindsey would. Lindsey Graham. Think. Lindsey Graham, I see, is more of an Albert Fish. <laughs> he seems a little kinkier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lindsey Mike Graham Pence. is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there Lord. you go. Oh, God. Yes. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. I'm making my own mother in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I, you know, it would be interesting to read the John Douglas book about how he, (laughs) how he perceives some of, some of these politicians, because one of the things that kind of comes up over and over in the book is this notion that, you know, these are, these are people who exist on a purely selfish level. They don't, they don't think of their victims other than they never do. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just Ever. hey I'm sorry I got caught I'm not sorry I did the the horrible thing I'm just sorry that the horrible thing got me in prison. Well, very rarely I think it's you know when we talked about Dahmer, I feel we were talking about someone a little different. I feel that Dahmer had a little bit remorse. Yes, da- Dahmer is the you know we we've. We I, they discussed this, but we like, discussed this that he he has certain exceptions as fucked up as he is or was. There are certain exceptions with him where he acknowledged that this was wrong and fucked up, and he just couldn't stop himself. Yeah, he right. just and he wanted almost to get caught. And at the end of the day, what he wanted wasn't to murder people. He wanted to, he wanted to create someone who could love him and, and couldn't run away from him. Yes. Yeah. And and, I mean, that's fucked up. Don't get me wrong. Like nobody here is defending, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or, or what he did, but, but compare him to all of these others. He is a real exception. Yes. He is a real exception to the rule. Yes, he he is w- truly one of the few killers in in the you know pantheon of murderers that I feel a high degree of sympathy for, be- because of how he grew up, what was wrong with him. Like at the end of the day, he was just this alcoholic gay dude who 
needed some sort of human contact and human love. And, there and he some- had had too many people in his life run away from him yeah. that he needed to be loved and he needed that security of love, yeah. like genuine love. And he was so afraid of it. And I, I just, and there were wires that got crossed. Yeah. And, and I you know, really feel that there are, it, it's interesting because Douglas doesn't you know, like he mentions Dahmer a couple of times, right. but doesn't really go into it because I think I, he's an outlier. Yeah. He's a total outlier compared to these other assholes. Yeah. I'm sorry. The others are just assholes. Yes. And they are highly selfish. They're fucking selfish as shit. Yeah. I, I mean, that is one of the, the hallmarks of, you know, all of these jerks is that, like I said, they're, you know, they are completely self-involved and, and I get that. Like I'm a self-involved asshole too, but you know, yeah, not compared to these guys, right? Not, not to that degree. And I, all, I also have enough awareness to remind myself like, no, 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 you need to look outside yourself. I, and, and also being able to express empathy and that kind of thing. Like I, I right, can, right. You, you express empathy. Thank you. <laughs> right. And, and so like, I'm not worried that I'm a killer or anything because I do have like emotions and you know, I, yeah. like I, I was telling you guys earlier, like I'll get, I'll, I'll read a bunch of news and get depressed. And then I see a Hallmark commercial and just blubber for a while because th- I need that emotional release. And, you know, and these th- like the, the kinds of people that Douglas are t- is talking about through the book, those, those are the kinds of people who don't have those emotional reactions. They, they tend to be in, unless they're in the sort of, you know, blood rage of, 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 uh, you know, make realizing their fantasies, then they tend to be kind of cold. And, and the only thing that they focus on is their, uh, intense fantasy life. And if they have murdered, they then incorporate their actions into that fantasy world so that they're just constantly reliving the, the real life, uh, uh, manifestation of their obsession. And, and in a lot of ways, it, it, the, the thing I find so interesting about the, the book as a whole is that it makes, you see the patterns and you can see how it makes them predictable and also ultimately a slave to their obsessions that a lot of the way, the ways that they're going to get caught is uh, because they're trapped by what they have to do. They're, they're by the rituals and the fantasy that they've created. You know, they, there's that bit early on in the book where uh, Douglas is talking about uh, his conversation with like a serial burglar or mm-hmm. no, it's a gambler, isn't it? Uh, where the, the gambler is like, you know, like look at those two bugs on the wall over there. Like I can bet on which one of those is going to make it to the windowsill first or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think that's the extension of, you know, he's, I think he's already in prison for something else. And then he, um, and then they're just gambling on the insects right. <laughs> behind bars. Cause yeah, that's what they and, do. Right. And, and, you know, uh, and, and Doug, what he gets out of this guy is, is the notion that if you think the result of like the winning the bet is the point, then you don't understand the, the compulsion. Yeah. Like the, the point isn't the, the final product of the compulsion. The, the, the point is the compulsion itself. Yeah. And, and so, you know, different from the idea of product and process killers, more that no matter if you're a product killer or a process killer, the act of killing or the act of having this dead body, that is the compulsion. And you can't change that. You can't, you know, and uh, you can't ferret that out of somebody with therapy and stuff. And I, I think I, I, you know, I, I, one of the more interesting stories I think is, uh, the one about Scott Glenn, uh, mm-hmm. from silence of the lambs of, you know, he came in as this sort of West coast hippy dippy dude. And I, I don't get the impression that John Douglas is, you know, a crazy fascist or anything, but no, because, because of his experience, he has a very, very definite opinion about the death penalty 
and Scott Glenn coming in being like, oh, I don't believe that anybody should, you know, the, the state shouldn't murder people and whatnot. And and I, I certainly sympathize with, with that uh, as well and and oftentimes believe it, too. But, you know, in the story, uh, as Scott Glenn is doing research for Silence of the Lambs, John Douglas, you know, plays tapes of of these killers and, and uh, you know, Scott Glenn immediately is like, I didn't know people could be that evil. And, you know, it just never registered that like it, it, you can't imagine that somebody's capable of, of that level of just sadism and 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 glee in the sadism. See, and I and I'm one of those people who is very aware that they can be that sadistic and can revel in it. And I'm still anti death penalty um, for a number of reasons. I, I know we've discussed some before and I won't get into it now, but you know, it, it's just, I feel that, uh, yeah, you have to be consistent across the board with I just, yeah, I, right. And that's, that's my problem with it is I agree. Uh, you know, mo- if you ask me 99% of the time, do you, do you believe in the death penalty? I would say uh, absolutely not. Like the the state should never have the right to to murder one of its own citizens. Right. But then again, like you you hear about like eh, you know here's here's uh you know the toy box killers or you know the uh, hillside stranglers or something. Yeah. And there's party that's like I there is no rehabilitation here. There like well I know there's no rehabilitation for someone like that. But for me, I see it as we can learn potentially something from them psychologically. So we can possibly prevent something like that in the future. And that's where I see the the value of keeping them alive. Like, because they're not going to be rehabilitated. I don't believe everyone should be handed just a blanket. Oh, life without the possibility of parole. Um, but that is someone where I'm like, no life without the possibility of parole, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, I, yeah. I you mean, know, that's my, that's where I have that exception on that thing. But you, I feel that we've got to learn from these kind of people. And this is, that's why something like a mind hunter is fascinating. And I, the fact that this is where their project kind of, this is how this unit started. Um, I think exemplifies that. Yeah. I, I mean, I We've got to talk to these people and figure it out. So, you know, these don't happen as often as I feel that they used to, but they, I mean, they still do. There's still going to be fucking assholes out there. Yeah. I, I mean, you're right. I, like, it's not like murdering, <laughs> murdering the, the people that, commit these crimes isn't going to stop the crimes or anything right you know i, I it's ju- not a deterrent the death penalty is not a deterrent right like that's one thing statistically has been proven right and and i i don't disagree with that I, like i said my only problem is when it when it comes to th- the notion of like hey it, there might be a a member of the family that has brought some measure of peace if you just sweep out the trash on this dude and yeah, but it still doesn't bring that person back. No, you're, you're right. You're right. And, but that's the argument I constantly have with myself. It's not about, it's such a unique thing, right? Like I think at the end of the day, and I I mean, I have not been a victim of a crime in that way, so I can't put myself in that position completely, but I have heard that from victims of that crime. And then yeah. it made an impression on me at a very early age. Yeah. When I heard that. Right. Like, like, so, you yes, know, I that's, mean, that's where I'm coming from too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so complicated because, uh, you know, like, what the fuck do you do with these people? Like, do, you know, yet punching their ticket seems to be the wrong way to approach it, but also maybe not. You know, I, I, and again, it is a debate that I have internally. And if you ask me how I would vote on the matter, I would say no death penalty because the idea that you accidentally killed one innocent man or woman would well, undo all yeah. of that. Oh, but, absolutely. Because it has been proven that has occurred, actually. 
Right. And that, uh, I mean, obviously that is horrifying. Right. So we can't, we can't risk that. We can't risk that. Yes. Yes. That's and, the and, other side of it. Yeah. So, you know, but I, but I, I do have that sympathy. I really do. I have that sympathy for people like a John Douglas. Who's like, Hey, you're you in may the not middle. Ag- you're in the middle of it. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, like you're the, the way that and you're you talking see. to the worst of the worst. Yeah. Yeah. The human beings that you are dealing with, you know, like when he says in the book, uh, you know, um, the, the notion that you, you want to just lock your kids in the house and keep them there for their life (laughs) for their entire lives, just because uh, you're dealing with the worst aspects of human behavior. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a complicated issue, but also one that I think, uh, not just the death penalty, but like, just in terms of like, do you incarcerate? Do you, do you put them in a special home where they can be studied? Like, how do you handle this? Yeah. And, and to me, the worst alternative is just locking them in a room and doing nothing with them. Well, that, and I mean, and I mean, sorry, but solitary confinement is, is beyond cruel and unusual punishment for anybody. Um, there's no reason that that's just beyond torture and for an extended period of time. Um, but I know this is a huge conversation, a huge rabbit hole we could get down. <laughs> yeah. and I know we're trying to tackle all these big problems. And I feel like this Johnny Douglas book, I mean, it does touch on some of this. Um, but, you know, it goes down these psychologies of these different people. And you're right. He, the Netflix series did bring a lot of these details to you know to certain things they profiled like you know the rock in that one case that took place in georgia or whatever and you know that whole the rock everybody has the rock you know and that kind of thing um but yeah this i know this is a huge huge uh rabbit hole we can go down um darren (laughs) yes Solve the problem. Darren, Darren okay. we want to give you a chance because Bo and I have been like totally like crime boy, you know, or crime, uh, crime that's, geeking out. Yeah. That's why we do this. I, I've been in, enjoying the conversation, interjecting my insight or questions to the more expert speakers at the moment. And that is one of the things that I really dig about our tradition of doing this. At least once a year, we go further in the hole. <laughs> we go, we go a little bit more and th- this i i mean i feel like some not in of the this shoe was, but in the hole yeah <laughs> yeah so, some of this is carryover from the last conversation and we're uh in our own way doing our bit of mind hunting and i did think you know we were talking about uh douglas trying to figure out you know his his stance on things and one of the things that stood out in the reading of this when he was an FBI agent, he is studying and analyzing the people that he's around in college, and he's talking about how they're paranoid and self-important, but he is sort of doing the thing that he says that they're paranoid for thinking that he's doing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, but also, like, the, the hey, he's got, he's got a wire in his pocket, that bit. Yeah. Uh, where he's just like, N- get over yourselves. Nobody is tapping. Nobody's coming in here with a recorder. Like, yes, I'm, I might be surveying some classes and so forth, but like there, I, I understand the, I think it's a subtle distinction that he's making between like, Hey, I'm here to just to observe some classroom stuff as opposed to I'm here to observe the students who are in this class. I'm not going through your garbage. I'm auditing Mm. your sociology class. It right. And, and I think that, uh, I think there's not just in that scenario where it's, you know, sort of the, the college liberals reacting to this FBI agent. The flip side of that is, uh, you know, the, the, the people who tend to be further to the right, who have this knee jerk, um, reaction to, you know, science and facts and stuff like that, that feel threatened by that. It's just, it, it's just the other side of the coin. 
Um, but uh, that has nothing to do with serial killers. I just find it interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, I think Mindhunter was it, it was interesting because I read uh, about and eh, I probably read two thirds of it and listened to about the first third on audiobook. And Vanessa and I had discussed this <laughs> all, offline. And I had originally read like a, a hard copy of this like a couple years ago after the mini series or the, the Netflix series came out. But this time I decided to do the audio. So anyway, go ahead, but Bo. Yeah. And so the narrator <laughs> sounds like Joe Friday. If, if he took just a little bit of helium and, <laughs> and a little it, bit of meth and a little bit of meth. It, it's just a lot of, you know, so I told him as soon as he, as soon as he caught the man slicing off that poor woman's nipples and eating them for, for lunch, I said, now there's a crackpot. We had quite the laugh. It is. I was waiting for him to say just the facts, ma'am. I was really waiting for that. I, it, I so yes. wanted that. <laughs> it, on, on the one hand, like, I don't think I want to hear this narrator narrate any other book. Oh, no. But it is perfect for for mind hunter well and the funny thing is is that in january i had listened to the latest johnny douglas book on audio and it was narrated by jonathan groff who plays the holding character on mind hunter and it was a totally different experience it's a totally different experience cuz he has a much calmer much more soothing kind of even keel thing and this was just like so amped up in comparison yeah. <laughs> and so gravelly and it was just it was too funny the the best uh in my, my favorite of the audio narration i didn't hear all of it because like i said i you know read the the back end of it uh my own self with my eyes and everything but when he's talking about um i think it's the spec interview Mm -hmm. where where richard speck isn't commenting on on much and it's uh and th they capture this scene in the show mine hunters too but so john douglas to get speck to talk then directs the conversation to speck's attorney who is in the room with them and yeah. he says you know what really burns me up about your client the fact that he took eight perfectly good pussies out of the world <laughs> and it like it's a shocking thing to hear an FBI agent say, but the way that the guy narrates it because it is so matter of fact, it's <laughs> exactly. like exactly. Yeah, no, and he says awful. he says eight rape cunts. That's right. Yeah. Eight oh my god. Cunts. And you're just like, and the way he he says it, you're just like, what? What is that? What? <laughs> yeah. It's, well, my partner didn't think much of that, but I knew I was getting through. Uh, yeah. It's exactly. Exactly. It, it was it was a real something, but it, I, I I had a great time both listening. I was to chuckling to that. I was chuckling to that. I knew it was coming, but it it was just funny. So what should I it, like uh, after Mindhunter? Should I go on to the other Douglas books? I think you should because I enjoyed some of the. So I had read some of his later books before I read this. And then I read this after the series came out, the first season came out. And then I, there were some, then I read, I just read his latest one. And I enjoy some of the other ones more than I enjoyed this. Uh, this was a good, you know, like groundwork of how the unit formed and everything. But there are some other ones that get into the nitty gritty. And the latest one is kind of just partially how he's continued his career since he's retired and how he gets pulled back in as a consultant and that kind of thing. All right. No, no yeah. matter every time he thinks he's out, they pull him back in. Right. <laughs> and, and, well, and it's also, he also can't stay away. It, sure. It's his own thing. He's just like, no, this is just what I'm interested in. I'm not, I, yeah, I'm there. I, I think there's a real, I, one thing I will say about Douglas, um, <laughs> in conclusion, one thing I, I will say about Douglas, I think he is very generous in talking about how as much as he was a driving force of, of this behavioral uh, science uh, being applied, that he, I, I think he also is very quick to say, and here are all the people around me mm -hmm. that we brought on and like this person became 
an expert in child crimes and this person being yeah. an expert in sex crimes. And like, there are other people who made not just names for themselves, but were trailblazers. Yeah. And he totally gives props to these other people. And whereas in, you know, we were all saying with a mind hunter series, Oh, fucking Greg, you know, and all that stuff. Right. He gives props to Greg in the book, you know, for doing a few things. Sure. At yeah. least a Greg. I don't know if it's supposed to be the same Greg that's in the, the series but you know what i mean yeah. you know it I'll um you're just it, like, okay he's given some props to these other people so he's not just taking credit for himself because he recognizes he's not just he's not the only one that did this and that's good because it's true it doesn't work that way it's a it, group effort he has a real uh i i think he saves a lot of of that not just goodwill, but genuine admiration mm -hmm. to uh, what's his name? Judd Ray. The, yeah. the one, well, I think the first African-American person in the unit. Yeah. And, but the, the fascinating thing that never made it to the show, but the, a story absolutely worth reading. If you're listening to this podcast um, is the story about um, Judd Ray's wife hiring hitmen to kill him. To the point that they bust into his house and shoot him. Yeah. And he he survives kind of out of sheer force of will, you know. I mean, aside from <laughs> the medicine and whatnot. But also, like, he <laughs> keeps himself awake and, and makes the phone calls he needs to make and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and you know, John Douglas is, is, again, quick to say, like, this is one of the most heroic things I ever even heard about. Yeah. Much less, you know, like he not only did he survive this, but he came back from that with this very unique perspective on what a crime scene can mean that some things aren't going to fit the narrative the way you think they will. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it again, just a super interesting book, just cover to cover. I really I found myself like sometimes uh when I'm doing a, a book for a show, I'm like, okay, well, I need to make sure that I read a couple of chapters today and a couple of chapters tomorrow. And this was one of those books that was, I didn't have to schedule it. You know, it was like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm, I will easily have this read well before we do a show because I'm just enjoying the read. Well, I didn't because usually when I do, I was doing an audio book this time. And usually when I do audio books, it's on my daily commute. And then all of a sudden, this stupid coronavirus thing happened and I've now been working from home for like three and a half weeks. So it, it was like, ah, screeching halt. And, and those last five hours of the audiobook kind of got put off until this week. <laughs> Cause I realized, Oh shit, I, I had, for, I hadn't finished that yet. <laughs> so yeah. I would have finished it very quickly, you know, if, if it had been my usual schedule, but um, every, I think everything's kind of thrown off right now, but uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than, you know, settling down at night in bed with stories of murder and mayhem. That's, uh, it, sad, but true. No, interestingly enough, I, I'll do my, uh, reading of my true crime books before and after work. And then a lot of my true crime podcasts while I'm at work, you know, while, you know, thinking I want to murder someone, but I don't actually murder them. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, little do they know that that's what I'm sitting there listening to as, you know, I'm just crunching numbers away. But um, anyway, yeah. So it sounds like you would recommend this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I I think it's a great book. I would recommend this too. I know that not everybody can handle the subject matter, obviously, but um, I feel that it's interesting in the way that, you know, it, it helps explains a lot about how this thing that we do consider as just every day now about profiling kind of came into existence. And it really wasn't that long ago. Again, you know, the 70, late seventies is when this is, this started early eighties, you know, it's kind of that time period. So, but Darren. Yeah. Uh, like I said, <laughs> I'm, a, I, I've, I study the psycho politicians more than serial killers, but it's really still just as interesting as when I was a 
14 year old with my A to Z encyclopedia of serial killers or something like that, where I feel like a lot of people start when they're getting the, the basic books. Um, I'm trying not to overhold Bo. I know you've you've got to go soon, so I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll ready. need to run here in a minute, but uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I I I do think it's a a terrific book. If if this is your jam, like if if you enjoy kind of exploring the darker parts of of human nature, otherwise it's it'll it'll freak you right the fuck out, and you shouldn't read this. Yeah, no, agreed. And this was also the basis for Jack Crawford and Silence of the Lambs too. I mean, you referenced that earlier, Bo. So I thought I'd mention that. Johnny Douglas was so right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like he, John Douglas himself, has been incredibly influential, not just in in crime, but in entertainment. Because right, exactly. W- without him, a lot of you know, like Thomas Harris sat in on some of his lectures and so mm-hmm. forth. So, yeah. um, yeah, it is, and uh, you know, also I think it is a big promotion for communication between uh justice departments and stuff like that like thank you he is very very much about like how do we make it as easy as possible for different you know uh, different uh like investigative agencies to correspond with each other to communicate with each other so that you don't allow paperwork to be the reason that someone dies and right, right. It, it like it, you know like i don't know that i would agree with john douglas about everything but he seems at the very least like a very decent and honorable man yeah no i know i agree with you on that i agree with you on that cool Thanks well, a lot, Bo. Thank, thank you for your thank time. you Bo, for yet another another year of this maybe we'll do it more than once a year maybe we'll do it you know right you're back you know twice a year or something we should we should or, have another month that goes crazy but yeah i or yeah. just something else i mean you know you're always a pleasure to have around oh thanks um uh, yeah no this is i always have a great time uh sorry i got i got to run on the quick here but uh oh, good um that was that was again very fun i i had a blast watching summer of sam and also reading mind hunter which was really satisfying not not just because the book itself is pretty good but because having seen the series it it mm-hmm. was it, it was a really great companion to be like oh wow this really is uh accurate yeah and i and i am really glad like rereading the book after the second season, even I was like, Oh, I'm so glad that they b- are bringing more of this from this book into the series. Yeah. Um, so I'm, cu- I'm curious to see like whenever they do finally get to a season three or if they get to that, um, considering David Fincher now, um, if they get to that, that, you know, are they can, going to do more of, you know, something else that's in mine Hunter or are they going to go on to some of his other books? Yeah, you I know, mean, cl- I'm curious clearly, how that plays out. Yeah, they've they've clearly been building up BTK, and it would obviously. also well, no, obviously, and I think you're going to have to go there. But what else? Yeah. It would also be really nice to have Anna Tor have something to do in that show, other oh, other no. than be gay and and no. have a bad relationship. Yeah, no, agreed. <laughs> I believe she I at least she got something last season, but still. It, it yeah, it just felt like that that character has been an afterthought and I mm-hmm. and I that's yeah. a bummer because I'm really into the the idea of like, oh, here's someone who comes at this from a purely academic point of view. Yeah. And I, I wish they would do more with that character. No, no, no. I know. I, I, I think she's a nice balance to it and it's very much needed. Hey, you podcast listener. Yeah. Hey, listen up. Hey, shut up. <laughs> I know you're looking for new things to binge and purge. <laughs> <laughs> Gayish is about gay stereotypes. We've talked about depression, drag queens, uh, butt stuff, fisting, animals. 
uh, fisting and animals are two different episodes, <laughs> just to clarify. You can find us on iTunes or wherever podcasts are given away for free. Tell your mom. She's probably gay. <laughs> Okay, we're back. We had a slight technical difficulty. I don't know where it, it cut out. Um, and Bo had the internet. To, yeah, I know. We had to use the internet. And unfortunately, Bo had to go. But we were wrapping up with him anyway. Um, yes, go to Legion Podcast to find out, find um, Bo. Pick six movies is his big thing going on right now. And Duncan and Bo who come correct. Uh, have things pop uh periodically as well but anyway darren would you like to tell everybody what's coming up uh soon yeah so later schedule uh, scheduling permitting i know you're you're still working but you're working from home right um we will be doing uh we should be doing our anniversary commentary yeah we were gonna do like try to do a regular april episode but our this is our March episode that got pushed to April, so I kind of feel like let's just cut our losses at this point. Everything has been thrown up in the air, and um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and skip it to uh, our anniversary commentary that we were going to do. And unfortunately, because we also because everything has been thrown out of whack, we haven't decided yet. Um, so. We will decide soon. We will decide soon. Um, I think by the time this is this, we post this show though, we will know and we will post on all of our social media what our May commentary is going to be though. Yeah. So VD Clinic Pod on Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group. Pro, pro, you know our cross Flick, Facebook groups, Flick, Flick chat. chat app. If anybody's still on there, yeah, I know we it, we've kind of been quiet a little bit lately, but I've been trying to start getting back into it. I mean, like it is a little bit easier, I have to say, with me working from home because I can actually take a five second or five minute break when I have a da- a moment of downtime and I'm not like looking over my shoulder like, God damn it, who's there? You know, <laughs> looking to see what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, look, look for that. And uh, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. This one of our longer and- episodes in a while. Yeah, and also, you know, make sure for our, you know, our anniversary episode, um, feel free to send us any well wishes or hate mail if that's what you want to do. Because, you know, there is part of me that just really wants someone to be hate listening to us. I just kind of love that concept. I think that'd be hysterical. Um, But (laughs) no, not really. But yes, (laughs) that's just really funny. Um, No, send us any questions you may have. We can read some questions on the on the air. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Anything else, Darren, you want to do you have anything else going on? Psycho Semanicast that you want to talk about? Uh, It's. I'm not exactly sure what at what point in in the uh, the shut in the pandemic the quarantine that that mm-hmm. the show will be. I know recently I just put out Escape from L.A. and uh, probably around the time you hear this or maybe a week or two before this comes out, uh, I've got uh, Twelve Monkeys. To, <laughs> yeah. And. Um, so yeah, I might be getting out of the the pandemic type of things and going into other types of movies. But yeah, there's still episodes regularly coming out over there. And um, no, thank you, thank you everybody, and keep keep uh, keep that distance. Yeah, well, and I was gonna say, I, I in late March I was on Scream Queens over there. We covered Species. And, um, God, I hadn't seen that in a while, but yeah, that was a whole, that was a whole experience, uh, 
Yes, I think um, poop vagina. That was a phrase that came up on that <laughs> on that episode. Um, but yeah, you can check me out over there on that. And um, but other than that, I just got this going on right at the moment. So, um, and you know what? I actually I have some books that I was books plural that I was going to give away for our anniversary episode. So um, I think, you know, we'll give some details about that on the anniversary show, but just a teaser right now, going to be books, plural giveaway. So um, you've got, been rationing your books during the shut-in. Oh, I've got a set of six I'm giving away. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. If I can still get into my post office, somebody... The other day, somebody told me, um, somebody that lives in the Bronx told me her local post office was actually closed. Oh, man. So I'm kind of, now I'm scared because I'm like, no, the post office was my, you know, lifeline. <laughs> It'll be one of the last things to close, but you might have to go a little bit longer to get to one. Yeah, maybe. But anyway. Oh, cops are coming. You know, there can't be an... Or that's fire truck. Still, uh, you know, there can't be an episode that goes by without there being sirens in Brooklyn. So, right. Although we did have them earlier, there were cop cops. There were cop cars earlier. So, you know, that's how that goes. But um, anyway, thank you again to Bo for being here. It wouldn't be March Madness without him. Right. Right. So. On that note, everybody stay safe. Cover your coughs and your sneezes. Or here, just cover your face anytime you go outside. Yeah. That, seriously, you got people looking like, you know, they're cowboys. So many people got bandanas and stuff covering their faces. They told us to cover our faces every time we go out, go out of the house now. Yeah, uh, what cotton bandanas are like five percent effective. Yeah, but it's yeah. So, nothing. yeah. Well, yeah. So basically, my tomorrow I'm sewing a bunch of face masks. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> been trying to figure out that problem. Not just for me. I've got other people who've asked for them. So yeah. I so join the list if you need to. <laughs> Contact me if you feel you need if you want some masks. So I can h- maybe help you out in that area. Venmo. Vanessa, I have a lot of fa- some some money for p- p- supplies. I have a I have a lot of fabric. I have a lot of fabric, so I could do it. I, they could be stylish. <laughs> hey, there we go. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> but yeah, thank thanks everybody, and uh, we'll talk yeah. to you soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.